Good morning, morning, church. Let's start with a word of prayer. Father, we're so grateful for this morning. So grateful that that you gave us today. There's many people in the world that didn't wake up today, but you gave us the grace to to have another day and fight to truly live for you. Thank you so much for this time of worship. We pray that you're with us. We pray that as we open your scriptures, you have a message for us individually as, as disciples, God, and collectively as the nation of spiritual Israel. Father, we love you more than life itself. Thank you, thank you, thank you for allowing a, a spark to start in this room yeah. that's literally going to set all of Houston ablaze like never before. We love you more than life itself. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to be here to worship the Lord with you this morning. Give her the Taylors and their communion once again. Give it up for the very roots of our band. Of course, we're just starting up the band here, amen. Today was our first go, and let me tell you, the Lord is building something powerful here. I'm excited. I'm excited for for the day that we literally have a stage. We have rows and rows of people. Let me tell you, there's going to be lights in the background. It's going to be incredible, but it starts with the faith today to start the band there. Amen. Amen. Today, we're we're going to be studying out some scriptures. I hope you're not surprised. And I'm personally encouraged as as we're going to open with the Bible and study one of the most famous passages in all the Bible. Of course, anyone who knows about heroes or knows about battles knows about this one well we're going to study on not the story but the historical account of david and goliath look over at first samuel chapter 17 come on bro come on bro now of course we remember the beginning of the history of god's people creation is in genesis 1 right and of course god calls abraham abraham has isaac isaac has jacob right yeah jacob has joseph and his 11 brothers They're led into Egypt. And after 400 years, they're no longer free men. But what are they? They're slaves. Mm -hmm. God calls Moses. And he uses Moses to free his people from slavery in Egypt. And he brings them through the Red Sea. Can you imagine being there? Like, that that, that isn't a a fable in the Bible. It's a historical account. Mm -hmm. The sea actually split for God's people. They walked through the Red Sea on dry ground. Then they went in the desert for how many years, church? 40 40. 40 years. The whole generation died. Why? Because of disobedience and because of faithlessness to God. Mm -hmm. Then God raised up who? Joshua. Joshua. We got that, right, church? So after Moses came who? Joshua. Joshua. Mm -hmm. And then Joshua led the people where? Into the promise, land, right? And they defeated many enemies. And as Joshua 14 says, the land had peace, right? And the people served Joshua, the people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and the elders. But what happened after Joshua? The judges. Now, the judges is one of the darkest times for God's people. Why? Look at this. Moses raised up Joshua, but what central leader raised up after Joshua? None. So God's people were autonomous. What does that mean? Each tribe was self-governing. Each tribe, through all the 12 tribes of Israel, were doing their own thing. Therefore, they became apathetic. Therefore, there was apostasy. They turned away from God. And God raised up 13 different leaders throughout the book of Judges. But every time there was disobedience, a leader would come. They kind of repent and they go back in the same old sin. So what happens then? First Samuel rolls around, right? Went to Genesis, Exodus. Leviticus, number two, Rami. Then we went into the book of Joshua. Mm -hmm. Then we went to Judges. Then comes first Samuel, and God raised up Eli. Mm -hmm. Eli's a a judge Mm -hmm. who unfortunately had some wicked sons and did some wicked things, but something he did good is he raised up Samuel. Mm -hmm. Then Samuel became the judge of God's people in first Samuel chapter three. Mm -hmm. Now it's interesting here. God's people made a point. Hey, we want a king to lead us. A physical king. And God's like, hey, I thought I was your king. And it hurt God and Samuel very much. But God says, you know what? Give them what they want. So God chooses Saul and Samuel anoints him as king of the Israelites. Now we come to a point here in 1 Samuel 17 
where the Israelites are at war against the Philistine empire and Saul is their king. Let's pick it up here in 1 Samuel 17, verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for and assembled at Soka and Judah. They pitched camp at Ephestimian between Soka and Ascaia. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Allah and drew up the battle lines to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites the other with the valley in between them. Woo, check this out. Mm-hmm. Come on. You got the enemies of God's people. Mm-hmm. They're lined up on one hill. And let me tell you, they're ready for blood. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they're ready for war. Yeah. Then you got God's people on this other hill. And let me tell you, we're going to see they're not ready for war, but they're standing there fearful of war. Mm-hmm. And then you have this valley in between them. And this war we're going to see in a little bit here was going on for 40 days. Can you imagine being at a standstill with an enemy for 40 days? Ooh. Wondering what was going to happen. Mm-hmm. Let's get more detail in the battle. Look at verse 4. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out from the Philistine camp. Now, that is not a good part to the story there, amen? <laughs> he was over nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. That's 125 pounds. Come on, Chris. On his legs and wore bronze sleeves. And a bronze javelin was flung on his back. His spear was like the shaft of a weaver's rod. And his iron point weighed a, a hundred, six hundred shekels. That's 15 pounds. Mm. And his shield bearer went in front of him. Oh my gosh. The Philistines have a champion. What's his name? Goliath. Yeah. And this guy was how tall? Seven, nine feet tall. Nine feet tall. Shaquille O'Neal, seven feet, one inches. And you look in, he, he, he is a man of a man. <laughs> but Goliath was a man of a man. <laughs> Nine feet tall. Yeah. Well over 200 pounds of armor. Oh. A sword like you've never seen. A spear with just the tip weighed 15 pounds. Oh. Can you imagine Shaquille O'Neal with that much armor and add two feet and he's running straight towards you to attack you? <laughs> Woo! Yeah. That, that, that's the enemy that's lined up against the Lord and his people. Uh-huh. Let's see what happens in verse 8. Mm-hmm. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistines said, this day I defy the ranks of Israel. Get me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. This guy was coming out for multiple days on end. Defying the armies of God and cursing God. Can you imagine that? Mm -hmm. This giant like you've never seen. Calling down. You know, we're trying to have church here. And this guy just starts cursing at us. (laughs) How dare you worship? Dude, we're worshiping. I don't care. I'm going to curse you. Can you imagine? This guy's distracting their way of life. It's making them feel dismayed and terrified. Mm -hmm. Now, what does Joshua 1.9 say when the people are going into the promised land? God says, do not be afraid. Do not be terrified. Mm -hmm. Now, it's interesting. The Philistines weren't terrified. Why? They had a hero. Mm -hmm. His name was Goliath. But here's the question. The Israelites are terrified because they don't have a hero. Who is the hero for the Israelites? See, the hero was called to be Saul. He was a giant of a man. He was a head taller than everyone else. See, the fight shouldn't have been David and Goliath. The story really should have gone Saul and Goliath. Yeah, that's true. But because of a continual disobedience to God, in 1 Samuel 16, 18, the spirit of God left Saul and an evil spirit came upon him. That's why he was so afraid. See, the moment you take your eyes off the power of God, Fear sinks in your chest like never before. A fear where they couldn't even stand. And all the men followed. 
we pick it up here in verse 12, a new dynamic to the story. Now, David was a son of an Ephraimite named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons, and in Saul's time, he was old and well advanced in years. Of course, as Chris was saying, he not necessarily referring to the married ministry. Verse 13, Jesse's three oldest sons followed Saul to war. The first was Eliab, the second Abinadab, and the third Shemaiah. David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep in Bethlehem. For 40 days, the Philistines came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. Now we see a couple different dynamics to the story. We understand this man named Jesse had eight sons. His three oldest sons followed Saul to war, but his youngest son, who was technically already an armor bearer to King Saul, you see that in 1 Kings 16, but he was still going back and forth to take care of his father's sheep. But here we have some insight. How bad was this time with Israel? It's 40 days, this big old giant came out every single day and cursed God's people. So, of course, Jesse knows how bad the war is. So he says, go and check on my sons to his youngest son, David. Go and check on your brothers. So he leaves his sheep there with another shepherd. See, he took care of his sheep. He says, all right, sheep, go on. He made sure sheep were taken care of. Mm-hmm. Then he went on to go check on his brothers, says, gave him some cheese and stuff. It's always good to bring, bring food for the commanding officer there. Amen. And then he went to check on his brothers. And let's see what happens in verse 20. Come on, bro. Early in the morning, David left his flock with the shepherd, loaded up and set out as Jesse directed him. He reached the camp as the army was going to its battle position, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. David left his things to the keeper of supplies and ran to the battle lines and greeted his brothers. As they were talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped forward from the lines and shouted his usual defiance. And David heard it. When the Israelites saw this, they all ran and fled in great fear. Now, what do we see here? David was so excited to see his brothers. He ran to him. I pray you're that excited for the fellowship today. You know what I'm saying there, guys? It's been a long week. You get to come to church and see your brothers and sisters. See, David was so excited. He ran to see his brothers. You know what I'm saying there, guys? Mm -hmm. Oh, baby. Are you with me, guys? David was so fired up. He ran to see his brothers. And then he saw them. And what happens? Then Goliath comes out. And he hears Goliath call down curse on God's people. And all the Israelites fled. But David doesn't flee. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He looks around. And if you read on, he's like, what's going on here? Yeah. The, all the Israelites are fleeing. But there's an enemy of God right there. He says, who's going to do something about this? And he realized, if, if no one's going to do anything about this, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill, him. Amen. I'm gonna kill Amen. Goliath. Yeah. Saul hears about it, but let's hear what Saul says. Verse 32. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart and count of the Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy and he has been fighting since his youth. What happened here? Finally, a man came forward at 40 days. None of the soldiers did, but a little shepherd boy. And what does Saul say? You can't do that. You're not capable. Hey, if I can't do this, you can't do this. This is impossible. But David insisted and he, he let him go and fight him. So he dressed him in Saul's armor and David couldn't walk around. Can you imagine what David looked like? A little shepherd and a guy who's a head taller than most men yeah. trying to walk around in Saul's armor. Can you imagine that? Like, funny. <laughs> he couldn't even reach for his sword. You know what I'm saying? So he puts down the armor. Mm-hmm. See, David understood. You don't imitate the actions. You don't imitate the outside. Yeah. You imitate the heart. There you go. And it's 1 Samuel 16. Why did God pick David? Because of his heart. Yeah. And if we're to be people yeah. of God, if we're to imitate the heart of David, which everyone in this room is called to do, we yeah. can't be about imitating the exterior. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good yeah, there you go. Good but point. imitating the heart. There, there was a time in our movement where preachers would imitate parts of how people would talk. And they'd say, Jesus, yeah. God. Right. And I was guilty of it. Yeah. And finally someone said, why do you do that? No, it sounds kind of cool. <laughs> you learn to imitate the hearts. Imitate someone's love for God. So what is, so David said, I don't need to imitate the way you look. Let me imitate the way God fights. 
Mm-hmm. Picks that down. I imagine he goes to the stream for a prayer walk. He says, God, whew, what am I going to get myself into? God, be with me. Picks up five stones. Why? Because he thinks he's going to miss Goliath four times? No, Goliath had four brothers. Therefore, he, wanted, he knew God was going to give him Goliath. He was confident of it. But he was confident he was going to take out the brothers if he needed to as well. Mm-hmm. So he picks up his five stones. And let's pick it up here in the story. Verse 41. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of them, kept I mean, closer to David. He looked at David and saw he was not more than a boy, rudy and handsome, and he despised him. And he said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? Like, how disrespectful is that? Am I a dog that you're going to bring this little stick boy out here? Like, he was really going for glory. Yeah. <laughs> and the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Mm-hmm. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. David said to the Philistine, this is important. You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord God Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those who gather here today will know it's not by sword or spear the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's. Remember that. Amen. Yes. And he will give you into our hands. As David moved closer to attack, as he had moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly to the battle line, reaching into his bag, taking out a stone, he slung it, and it struck the Philistine in the forehead. Then the stone stank, sank into the forehead and he fell face down on the ground. David runs over, gets a sword and chops off his head. Then all the Philistine army runs in fear. There was a great victory. Isn't that incredible? Amen. After 40 days of suffering, the army did nothing. A little ruddy redhead shepherd boy comes up. With a sling, imagine them laughing at him. They all got their big swords. They've been training for years. <laughs> Everyone's kind of like laughing in their hearts. Okay, well, it was nice knowing David. All the brothers, like, how are we going to explain this to Jesse? <laughs> 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 Hits him. They're like, oh, he hit him. <laughs> then he falls to the ground. Then David runs over. See, D- David wasn't a boy. He was a man of heart, runs over, grabs his sword, and chops off this guy's head, and then just holds him by his hair. And then all the enemies fled. But I love what David says to the Philistine. He says, the whole world will know. Yeah, come on. You know what's interesting? The whole world knows the story of God saving the Egyptians, saving the Israelites from the Egyptians. Yes, yeah. The whole world knows the story of God bringing his people into the promised land in the time of the judges. The whole world knows the story of God using a puny little shepherd boy to defeat the champion of the Philistine empire, David. Mm -hmm. The whole world knows. For us, we need to understand we are in a battle today. And no, it's not against the Philistine empire. But we are in a battle against Satan and his kingdom. The moment you were baptized into Christ, you signed up for a battle. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I thought, you know, it's it's like a peaceful Christianity thing. We just look. No, you're at war. Yeah. There you go. And the moment you're no longer at war, guess what? You're joining the enemy's side. And as true disciples, we need to understand what has Satan done? He's taken the message of the scriptures and he's completely watered it down. There you go. What is American Christianity? Mm Mm-hmm. It's a just bleed. You can have your Texas home, make all your money and your white picket fence, your two car garage and your boat in the driveway. You get yourself like a cowboy, you know? You believe. You accept the Lord and you go to church you want, but you can do what you want on the other days. You don't really need to get open. You don't really need to live like, you don't really need to help anyone else. See, that's the message that Satan spread. It's evangelized the entire world. Yeah. But if you read the scriptures, that's not what you find. Yeah. Yeah. Not even a little bit. Therefore, as true disciples of Jesus Christ, yeah. Yeah. we've been given the charge to take the true message of the Bible yeah. throughout the entire world. And yes, we are the minority here in Houston, yeah. and we are the minority as the movement of God. Yeah. Yeah. 
But God has called us to spread this message in our generation yeah. so the whole world will know. That's the title of our lesson this morning. Amen. The whole world will know. Come on. Come on. If we want the whole world to know, there's a few things we got to learn. Our first point, we need to learn to love the battle. Yes. We need to learn to love the battle. Come on. If you notice, there's certain principles I've been preaching over and over to really fight us to grasp as a church. This is a big one. If we're really to mature as a church, we need to genuinely learn to love the battle. Let's see what that means. First Samuel 17 and verse 11. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. What do we see here? Saul and the Israelites hated the battle. They feared the battle. They were tired of the battle. These warriors were running away every single day. Isn't that a little backwards to you? This is the army of the living God, the creator of the universe. What happened to all the great stories in the Bible where all these miraculous miracles happen? What's going on? Exodus 14, 14 says, God literally tells people, I'm going to fight for you. All you need to do is be still. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the, the heart of God in the scriptures is if you are with God, he is with you and you're going to have victory. If you are with God, there's guaranteed victory. Mm. But what's the other side of that? The antithesis is if you're not with God, you're going to have guaranteed defeat. Therefore, why were God's people living in fear? Mm. Because ultimately they weren't close to God starting with a leader who was a fall away in God's kingdom. Saul was a fall away in God's kingdom. And everyone was imitating his lack of faith. It's a good, good lesson for a church leader. For me to make sure I'm staying faithful every single day. Yeah. But then it's a good lesson for Bible talk leaders. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. You are the spiritual ceiling of your Bible talk. And if your faith is low, guess what? It's going to be like Saul. The people are going to scatter. Yeah. Yeah. But then it's a good lesson for every single disciple. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Understanding you influence those around you. And you're called to lead those to Christ. You're called to be a leader. Everyone in this room right now, today. Yeah, come on. Yep. Let's see what happens here. Yeah. Come on, bro. We read on with the story. In chapter 17, verse 48. As the Philistine moved closer to David, David ran quickly to the battle lines. Okay, so they were running, but what did David do? Ran. They ran to it. They were running away from the battle, but David was running to the battle lines. Mm-hmm. Why? David loves the battle. Yeah. David learned to love the battle. Mm-hmm. David hears Goliath disrespecting God, and he doesn't yeah. cower in fear and say, oh, no, this is scary. I'm going to go home to dad and go take care of my sheep. This, this isn't good. He says, who does this guy think he is? Mm-hmm. He got ticked off. Yeah. He got indignant. Mm-hmm. See, it wasn't a people thing for him. It was a God thing. Yeah. David didn't want this guy to shout those things because it was hurting God. Yeah. It wasn't like a masculine thing. Oh, let me show how tough I am. Mm-hmm. This guy's disrespecting my king. Yeah. So therefore, he is filled with the righteousness, indignation, and zeal to stand up for the honor of God. Yeah. But he didn't fear the battle. Why? Because he had a great walk with God. Look over in Psalm 18. Let's get, a, let's get an inside look at David's walk with God. Yeah. Come on, bro. In Psalm 18... We pick it up in verse 21. For I have kept the ways of the Lord. This is David. And I have not done evil from turning from God. All his laws are before me. I have not turned away from his decrees. I have been blameless before him. I have kept myself from sin. The Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanliness of my hands to the faithful you show yourself faithful to the blameless you show yourself blameless to the peer you show yourself peer but to the crooked you show yourself shrewd you save the humble you bring low those whose eyes are haughty you O oh lord keep my lamp burning oh my god turns my darkness into light with my god i can advance a troop with my god i can scale a wall as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is flawless. He is a shield for all who take refuge in him. For who is God beside the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? It is God who arms me with strength and makes my way perfect. 
He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to stand on heights. He trains my hands for battle. My arms can bend a bow of bronze. You give me your shield of victory. Your right hand sustains me. You stoop down to make me great. Isn't that incredible? Oh, yeah. David says, God is my rock. God is my shield. He says, God is my reward. God keeps my lamp burning. He says, what keeps me fired up? It's my walk with God. Amen. What makes me feel secure as a man? Is every man struggles in security. Yeah. They don't want to admit it. Yeah. Yeah. Dave said, what keeps me secure? It's my walk with God. He said, what gives me courage to fight any army? It's my walk with God. Mm. See, David did not fear the battle because his eyes were on God. He had confidence that reliance on God was the number one most important yeah. thing. He understood it wasn't about his size. He was smaller than Goliath. It wasn't about age. It wasn't about talent. It wasn't about education. It's not about financial demographics. Amen. Amen. Come on. But he understood the battles won based on your walk with God. Yeah. Yeah. Therefore, we, we really got to ask ourselves. We really got to ask ourselves where we're at today, specifically with our walks with God. Amen. Not how's your quote unquote quiet time, but how's your walk with the Lord? How do you know how your walks are going? Well, it's two things you got to ask. Number one, do you love the battle or are you fearful of the battle? Mm -hmm. And number two, are you burned out from the battle? See, there's no, of course, if you're faith filled, there's no such thing as fear because there's no fear in faith. Mm -hmm. But at times people say, oh, I'm burned out from the ministry. Oh, I'm burned out from doing that. If you you don't even know what the ministry is. You don't even know what the ministry is. If you're truly walking with God and you're serving God in the ministry, you feel refreshed every single day. Amen. See, if you're truly walking with God, it's not, oh, I'm burned out. It's, whoa, I'm tired. I need some rest so I can wake up and have a great quiet time yeah. in the morning. Yeah. Come on, bro. See, we need to make sure, church, that we're getting deeper in the scriptures than ever before. Yeah. This is important. I know in the past I felt, man, I'm, I, I'm not getting too much out of what I'm reading right now. Yeah. Even in the past, in ICCM, we had to go through Genesis to Revelation. And I get to Leviticus and Romans. Man, it's kind of boring here. Amen. Like, I'm just not finding anything inspiring. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you've felt like that before. Oh, yeah. We need to make sure that we're getting more out of the scriptures than ever before. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So grateful. I read through Leviticus this year, and it's literally my new favorite book. Yeah. But if you feel like you're not getting a lot of the scriptures, I try- challenge you before the Lord today. You ask the person that God put in your life, what should I study out? Maybe it's a specific book. Maybe it's a theme in the scriptures. Maybe it's a book to supplement while you read. Mm -hmm. But you need to be inspired. There's so many. There's thousands of promises God gives here for you. And if you're not walking away inspired, if you're not walking away faith-filled, something's wrong with your walk with God. You're not in the vine. But it's time today. You got to get in the scriptures every day. And don't have a checklist quiet time. But it's time to get inspired. And when we read, guys, when we read, we need our prayers that transform our hearts and our lives. Prayers that make us feel refreshed every single day. It's time to get our eyes back on the Lord. How did God prepare David for Goliath? He just woke up one day and went to Goliath? No, look back in 1 Samuel 17. Keep in mind David's conversation with Saul. And we pick it up in verse 34. David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or bear came and carried off the sheep from the flock, I went down and struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by the hair, struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because the the Lord, because he has defiled the armies of the living God. Verse 37, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hands of this Philistine in the church stands. What do we see here? David was a shepherd and his job was no joke. Lions and bears would come and attack his sheep. And what would he do? Rescue him. Can you imagine how most shepherds would feel about that? A lion comes while you're trying to take care of the sheep and carries it off. That's not what I signed up for. I'm out of here. A bear comes. Woo! I'd run out of there. Can you, like, realistically, this is history. Can you imagine that? Like, a bear comes when you're trying, like, imagine, like, you volunteer to, to walk people's dogs. Ten dogs. 
And then a pack of coyotes comes up. Or Rottweilers, you know what I'm saying there? You, you probably wouldn't stay around and try to kick off the Rottweilers, you know? <laughs> I'd run pretty fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what did David do? David wasn't a hired hand. No. See, we need to have a conviction to protect the family. That's part of loving the battle. Amen. We protect each other physically. And brothers, we have a conviction to protect our sisters. If it's late, we walk them to their doors. Yeah. Yeah. We protect each other physically. Mm. We protect each other spiritually. That's why we have kingdom dates. Of course, they're not romantic dates, but they're encouragement times where the brothers and sisters go on double dates and protect each other's purity. Why? Because people in the world want to take the sisters on dates yeah. or women of the world want to take the men on dates. Yeah. So yeah. we encourage each other and guard each other's hearts yeah. like David protected the sheep. Oh, yeah. But he fought a bear. Could you imagine that? You ever seen The Revenant? Yeah. That's a good movie. Great movie. Where the guy actually, a bear attacks him. He ends up killing it. But it's a fight. He, he breaks every bone in his body. It's not like, like smooth sailing. Like every bone in a... gets crushed by this thing multiple times. Mauls him. Literally, basically dead. Yeah. But with the spirit of God, David defeated bears. Wow. With the spirit of God, David defeated lions. You ever seen that video on YouTube where the guy's head stuck in the lion's mouth at the yeah. circus? Yeah. David personally defeated lions. Mm-hmm. This is fact. Yeah. Amen. You see, God used these lions and bears, these seemingly small trials, to train David for something bigger, his destiny, Goliath. Mm-hmm. You know, we need to understand, church, that we're in a spiritual battle. And at times, I feel I have a Goliath in my life. You guys ever feel like that? You have a Goliath in your life. I want to put before you, none of you have Goliaths in your life yet. But we all have lions and bears. But what's the problem? Lions and bears are scary. Lions and bears attack. So we see the lions and bears. We get spiritually discouraged, and then we throw in the towel and we give up on the lions and bears. See, that's a dangerous thing to do. You know, I've learned a thing or two about temptations to quit this week. Yeah. Doing the master cleanse. Amen. 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 It's, it's a cleanse that's not meant for everyone. And it, it really isn't meant for everyone. You, you should ask your doctor for wondering if it's going to be healthy for you or not. Yeah. Yeah. But it's essentially a cleanse where you go 10 days with no food. Woo. It's a cleanse, not to lose weight, but to ultimately restart your immune system. Mm-hmm. Get all the impurities from your body, to detox your body. So every day you, you drink salt water, a pint of salt water every morning, oh, oh. laxative tea at night, and the only thing you can eat during the day is this mix here of, of water, a little bit of lemon, a little bit of organic maple. syrup, maple syrup, and cayenne pepper. Oh. Chug, chug, it burns. Oh. Umami food. Umami. <laughs> but day one day one we started off mm-hmm. and day one is known as the bandwagon everyone's excited for the master class. I look at that as day one of Christianity <laughs> Woo! I'm a Christian smooth sailing this is easy this is a lie that's how I felt <laughs> then day two came that's okay, but by the night time, I was kind of bragging. People say, yeah, I'm doing the master cleanse. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to do it every year. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then day three came. Then reality, oh my gosh, seven days left of no food. <laughs> <laughs> Mommy, daddy. Yeah, no Lord Jesus, please help me. And then I did a Bible study with Jay, and I forgot. I, I've been doing these studies for seven years. I forgot some, Bible, uh, some scriptures in the study. I was like, wait, 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 let's go back here. <laughs> How many of you are there? <laughs> But then I was encouraged. We have a group me, a group chat going on with everyone doing the cleanse. And then it kept me strong. I saw all the brothers and sisters po- posting their temptations. Mm-hmm. I can do it. I can keep going. Yeah. Then day four came and I was genuinely tempted. I looked at food and I thought about quitting for the first time on day four. Oh. But I looked at the group me. I confessed to the disciples. I prayed to God. I got strength. And I literally started feeling a little mentally off. I was like, I'm going to be okay here. <laughs> but the Lord strengthened me. Yeah. Then I woke up and day five was terrible. Yeah. Oh, I felt sick. Yeah. I felt tired. And then you're detoxing. I don't know if you've ever seen a movie where people are detoxing from like, you know, illegal drugs. It's like that, but with food. So every day you wake up a little bit shaky. Yeah. It's dense. Mm. And I woke up, I felt sick. I felt scared. I felt dizzy. And then I felt emotionally tired. You know when that happens to the disciple? 
when you just get emotionally burned out, you're just like, I, I just need, I need a little break spiritually. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sinfully. Yeah. And what's my temptation? I like to eat. See, my sinful yeah. nature, my idol when I'm not close to God is food. Mm-hmm. Burger King, oh. McDonald's, Taco Bell, whatever it is. <laughs> and this guys, no. has exposed the sin in my heart, what I like to rely on when I'm not close to God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what happened? Day five rolls around. We have Devo. I literally think I'm going to, I've never felt like I'm actually going to faint. I felt like I was going to faint. I was at Devo and everyone's like, we're all laughing. We're about to get started. And I lean on sure. No one knows. I'm like, I'm going to faint right now. <laughs> they're going to, my people are going to pick me up and they're going to take me to the hospital. It's all good. I don't even care. I'm just, I give up. I die. This is good. <laughs> Come on, God, get this thing moving. Take me out. Take me out. <laughs> And then I was kind of like bitter that I didn't faint a little bit. And then we put on this movie and there was food in the movie and I made a decision to quit during the movie. I was like, I'm done with this stupid thing. How can I be a minister of a church? How can I do all this? How can I take care of my wife? How can I live my life? So I text my wife during the movie, I'm done with this thing. She's like, babe, you should pray about it and just get some advice. Get, get Tyler's thoughts. How dare you tell me to get advice? Yeah, I tell everyone else to get advice. How dare you tell me to get advice? <laughs> so Tyler, my mentor in Dallas, he, I, I texted him. He's the one who encouraged me to do it in, in the beginning two years ago. And two years later, I decided to take his advice. <laughs> <laughs> but I texted him. Hey, bro, hope all was well. I need your advice. Tonight at devotional, I felt like I was going to faint. I have been having plenty of water and lemonade mix. And also, I feel extremely emotionally weak. I feel mentally off. I feel like I need to stop the cleanse. What are your thoughts? And I told him, bro, you need to quit. Thanks for your message. That's your call. You made the decision to do it. Therefore, I don't think you need my decision to stop it. I think you can do it. It's a great thing to accomplish. And if you don't, and you don't want to quit in a moment of weakness. If you think it's unhealthy for you and it's damaging, then that's something you need to consider. However, I wouldn't quit at 10.30 p.m. and at night when you're at home doing nothing. That's just me. I'm sorry things are happening, though. It sounds really tough and challenging. Love you. I was so angry. Doesn't he know what I'm going through? I'm in a dance. And then I just put on a movie and I bitterly went to sleep on the couch. And then I woke up and I was still bitter. But I felt better, but I was still bitter. Why? Because I didn't get the comfort that I wanted. But after my quiet time, I felt great on day six. And then today is day seven. Over seven days with zero food, relying on the power of God. Amen. Then again, we got about 20 more minutes for the sermon. So who knows what can happen in 20 minutes there. Amen. You got it. You got it. So many temptations to quit. Why are there so many temptations? Because we live in a world that teaches it's okay to quit. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Cell phone plan, AT&T, switch to Verizon, just quit. Come on over. <laughs> Car contract, you don't like it? Nissan, come over to Mazda, it's much better. Yeah, quit that thing. Edu- yeah, quit the education, start this job. Or quit the education, switch to this school. Oh, job, don't put in your two weeks notice. Who needs character and integrity? Ooh. Relationships? Even in the kingdom sometimes, I don't really like him anymore. I'm just going to pull my heart back slowly and not really be as giving to that person. Mm. Talk about it. Bro. Being a disciple is the first thing in my life I even quit. Yeah, it's true. Come on. Yeah. Over seven and a half years, I quit everything else. Yeah. Went to music school, $30,000 music school debt. I quit being a musician. I quit trying to be a professional skateboarder growing up. I quit multiple relationships. I quit different lifestyles. Being a disciple is the first thing in my entire life that I haven't quit in marriage. Come on, Come on. Quitting is a dangerous thing. Yeah. And if we're to truly fight these battles, we need to have the conviction. Yes, the righteous fall down seven times, but the proverb says they rise again. Yeah. Yes. What are the lions and bears we need to fight? We need the battle of openness. Amen. This church really needs to get a conviction of integrity and that God sees you. Yeah. Yeah. God El Roy, right? The God who sees me. Mm-hmm. He sees everything you think. He sees everything you do. Therefore, we need to act every moment as if God and the disciples are with us and constantly bring God glory. Hey, if it's a great day, you bring God glory. If it's a tough week, you still bring God glory. If the church is 100,000 people, you bring God glory. But if it's two people, you bring God glory. 
We need to have a conviction to be open with sin. Yeah. The amount of deceit that sneaks into this church, guys, it is disgusting. It's terrible. Yeah. Yeah. We had a men's midweek where we were preaching about purity and about sin, and every one of us got open. Yeah. Yeah. And guys, there was a ton of hidden sin in the church. Yeah. One of our brothers got open with masturbation and pornography that he had to confess. Others with, with masturbation, others with different stuff. All this different stuff was confessed. Mm-hmm. See, we need to have a conviction to become little. I'm wondering, man, why is there different challenges in the church? Why aren't we having the effectiveness God wants us to have? Yeah. A lack of openness. Yeah. Yeah. Why doesn't church grow? Exponentially, church in the Bible. Lack of openness. Yeah. Yeah. We need to make a decision mm-hmm. to be completely open yeah. all the time. Right. At the temptation level. Temptation is not sin. There's steps to sin. Yeah. Oh, I fell into sin. No, you didn't. What'd you do? You had a thought. Yeah. yeah. What'd you have a thought? Then you put it, then you really thought about it. Then yeah. you, say, say it's pornography. Then you went over to your computer. Mm-hmm. Then you opened your computer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Then you typed in the website. Mm-hmm. Then you searched for a website. Then you looked, then you clicked. Then you searched for the thing you wanted to find. Then you mm-hmm. found it. Yeah. Then, then you did all the rest of the impurity. We won't go into detail. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's tons of steps. Don't you dare tell me, oh, I fell into sin. No. Yeah. No. There's steps to sin. Come on. Yeah. 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 And we need to have a radical conviction in this room. You get open at the temptation yeah. level. Yeah. It's time to be a church of radical integrity. Yeah. 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 Come on. I really hope we can get a clap for that one. Because yeah. Yeah. That, that means it cuts you. But it's time to have radical integrity and radical openness. It's time to be a church of humility. You have not arrived. The moment you think you've arrived, you're far from it. I've never been at this point in life and you've never been at your point in your life. We need constant help. The battle of unity, being more unified as a church and movement than ever before and especially being unified on a sold out base. The battle of making disciples. Y'all done so good with the campaign really going out there making disciples. And I'm so proud of you guys. And for those visiting, the battle of learning to be a disciple. It's not just American Christianity, but it's learning to totally repent of your sins, as Acts 2 says. Then you get baptized into Christ, then you persevere as a disciple, with other disciples around you, and you live a life to make disciples. Yes. Yes. How are we going to not quit these battles? You got to get closer to God. Come on. Yeah. We're ever, oh, I'm close to God. No, you got to get closer to God. I need to get closer to God. Yeah, there you go. Number two, you got to build deep relationships. Yeah. We've been talking this over and over. I challenged everyone in the church, have three deep relationships. Mm-hmm. How's it going? Raise your hand if you've gone after that. If you've genuinely gone after building three relationships. Mm-hmm. If you've taken the challenge. Amen, guys. You can put your hand down. Mm-hmm. we got to not just hear the scriptures, but go after the challenges. This is yeah, to keep you right. faithful yeah. and to elevate our church. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. If, you don't have, if I didn't have group me and Tyler, I would have given up the cleanse and I wouldn't be able to preach you. And let me tell you, the other cleansers would have been discouraged this morning. Yeah. They would have looked at me like a hypocrite. What does he think he's doing up there? Yeah. Mm-hmm. We need close relationships around us. Yeah. Number three, make a decision and never give up. God can work with failures, but not quitters. There you go. Right. Some of you have too many back doors still. You have too many back doors that you can still go sin at. Whether it's brothers and you have women you can go see. Whether it's women at work, women in different places, women at the gym. Yeah. Whether it's drugs or alcohol, your family's house and there's stuff back there. Mm-hmm. Whether if it's websites, whether it's a lack of covenant eyes and accountability in your phone. Whatever it is, some of us have too many back doors. Yeah. Yeah. And we got to delete any of those old numbers we got. We got to throw out any of that stuff. We got to make a decision uh-huh. to close every single back door. That's right. Amen. Why? Because you can't mature until you get past the lions and bears. A lot of us think, oh, I'm ready for Goliath. I'm ready for the next stage of my life. But what does God say? I'm not going to move you from this particular bear until you go through it. I'm not going to take it. You're not going to mature. And a lot of you wonder, why is my life at where it's at? It's the church's fault. No, it's your fault. You're exactly at where you're at in your life because of you. Your life is where you're at because of you. And it's time to take ownership for yourself. It's time to make a decision to never quit. And number four, we need to run to the battle with joy, just like David. Yes. Yeah. Once you start making disciples, let me tell you, everything naturally falls into place. Yeah, I love this story of Mason Fidelica. He was on the mission field with us in Australia. Joe Willis was the mission team leader. And Mason was having some lions and bears. He was at home and he didn't want to come out of his apartment. And he didn't want to come evangelize. And he didn't want to be joyful. So Joe and me knocked on his door. Mason, come on, it's time to go evangelize. And sorry, Lee, he said, mate, come on, mate, let's go. And he comes on out and he shares with one person, like, ticked off. And he shares with a few, Joe shares with it. Then he shares with the second. And he shares at that moment, his heart softens. Mm-hmm. 
and he understood Luke 9, 23 for the first time. You must deny yourself. Yeah. And once he denied himself, his heart softened. He remembered the cross. He remembered the mission. He went out and evangelized like crazy. Amen. You know what? That was a lion and bear. Now he is Goliath. He's officially, as of last week, the leader of the San Diego International Amen. Christian Amen. Church. <laughs> See, victory is from God. But my brothers and sisters, it's time to love the battle, the, the battle that no one sees. Yeah, for real. See, victory is not the joy. The joy is loving the battle, not the GLC when there's glam and glitz yeah. and everyone's cheering and all these titles are being given and all this stuff and you're all you're baptizing. What's the battle? When no one's watching, you're alone and you make those decisions of integrity. Yeah. When you would normally get discouraged and buy a pint of ice cream and eat it. <laughs> but you read your Bible instead. When you normally choose to give up, but you refuse to quit. It's time to love the battle. Our second point today, learn to believe. Learn to believe. Look back in 1 Samuel chapter 17. Come on, brother. Come on. I'm going to take my watch off for the second point. I don't want to get distracted. Amen. Read the word. First Samuel 17. I did think about this this day for many days. I, I dreamed about it. Verse 32. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Before David even went in the battle, he had confidence. He had confidence it was done. Mm-hmm. He had confidence it was done before the battle started. Why? Because his confidence was in God. It's interesting here. What happens right before the battle with David and Goliath? What happens right before the battle? Look here in verse 28. When Eliab, David's older brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the deserts? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You have come down here only to watch the battle. Mm. What happens right before the battle? His brother comes and says something that helps try to steal his faith. Yeah. Interesting, huh? Uh-huh. But then look in verse 39, 33. Saul replied, you are not able to go and fight this Philistine. See, right before the battle, Satan fights to steal David's faith through some of those seemingly closest to him. Mm-hmm. See, Satan will even use the people close to us at times yeah. to steal our faith. Yeah, that's true. But we need to make a decision that it's not about what people say. Yeah. It's about having faith in God. See, David had confidence in the battle before it even began. Mm-hmm. Watching this football movie last night, remember the Giants? Yeah, come on. And it was, oh, what is it called? Facing the Giants. What did I say? Facing the Giants. It was good. It was good. You should watch it. You should watch it. But the point is that there, there's this, 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 this young kicker, and he was a soccer player, and it, it, he's kicking on this football team, and he's never kicked for a football team before. And his name's David. And He's thinking to himself, this is impossible to actually get it through, through the post. Mm-hmm. So finally, he gets a few through posts, has a few success, but they finally get this like, uh, you know, underdog team. They get to the state championships. Yeah. And he has to kick the ball through 51 yards. The longest he's done oh. is about 30. Ooh. He's like, this is impossible. He goes out there and he's like, oh, I'm going to make it. You can see it in his face. Mm-hmm. Then the other coach calls a timeout. He goes to, the, to his coach. He says, hey, you're already defeated. If you believe you're not going to make it, you are absolutely right. not going to make it. He says, you, you got to see it going through and believe it. Then his dad's in a wheelchair. He can't stand. But you see his dad leaning up against the fence and stay, even though it's impossible for him, he stands on up, leaning on the fence. And he puts his hand like this, saying, hey, you got to go through the narrow way. And I'm just like crying at that point. <laughs> and then he kicks it on through and they win the state championship. See, David believed the battle was done before it even happened. You know, the last thing that Satan wants is for you to go to whatever battle with faith. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
whatever battle, believe him. Especially believing that God is with you and that you have the power of God. Because if you remember you have the power of God, he's, he's, he's going to flee. If you remember you have the power of God, you have guaranteed victory. And that's the last thing he wants, but he wants to steal your faith. How does he steal our faith? He puts faith stealers in there. One faith stealer I, I like to think about is storms. How unpredictable are Texas storms? Okay. Storms are the, the trials and challenges in life you don't see coming. How unpredictable are the storms of life? Whether it be financial, family, yeah. ministry, job, or even sin. Woo, I sins. Yep. Then you get discouraged for like three weeks. Mm-hmm. Peekaboo, guess what? You're a sinner. Yeah. Even though you're saved. Mm-hmm. It's time to confess your sin, move on, and accept the grace. Yeah. Yeah. Now you got to repent. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. But you can't be surprised when sin happens. Yeah. Yeah. You can't be surprised when financial challenges happen. You can't be surprised when problems happen at work or with the family. Mm-hmm. Don't let the storm steal your faith. Yeah. Worries, Matthew 6, 25 to 33. Worries are sin, Jesus says. Do not worry. Yeah. If God says do not, what does that mean? Don't. Don't do it. Worry steal your faith. For me, for a long time, I didn't have this conviction. Now as a church leader, I start to worry, and there's a lot to worry about as a church leader. Y'all give me a lot to worry about. Amen. Y'all give me a lot to worry about. But I love you. We love you. But then I made a decision. That's sin. No, there's concern and love, but then there's worry. Yeah. And I had to make it a decision. Oh, Jason, don't worry. I had to pray for a second. And I've had to train myself. That, that's sin. You got to train yourself to stop worrying. Yeah. Yeah. The third faith stealer, doubting. Doubting God's power. Yeah. Doubting God's purpose for yourself, the church, and the world. And doubting God's power. Believing that God can do the impossible. And the fourth faith stealer, forgetting the miracles what God has done. Of course, the greatest miracle, you becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ. There you go. Yeah. Your sins, sins being forgiven is the greatest miracle. But also forgetting what God has done to allow you to help other people become disciples. Yeah. One of my favorite movies in the world, it's called Kung Fu Panda. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> and it's about, a, if you don't know it, a, a panda who learns Kung Fu. Oh, wow. And Poe's called to fight Tai Long. The, this warrior who's... In, destroyed many valleys, done many bad things. And Shifu, this little uh, rodent-looking guy, it's called to train the panda, who's a great, great master, right? Shifu is. Yeah. So he's like, this is an impossible situation. He goes to Ugwe, his master, on top of this hill. He's like, Ugwe, I can't do it. This is impossible. You need to come and defeat Tai Long. You need to come and do it. I don't know. He says, no, it's going to be the panda. No, what are you talking about? You're crazy. And he doesn't realize, but Ugwe is about to get taken away with the spirits and the wind and the leaves and everything. So Uwe says to him right before he's taken away, you don't need me. All you need to do is believe. Then he's taken away with the wind. (laughs) Uwe gave faith to Shifu. Shifu gave faith to Po. And Po defeated Tai Long and saved the Valley of Peace. (laughs) See, you may may laugh at the the movie, but having courage in the battle is just the same. It's choosing to believe. It's choosing to believe. David made a decision to believe. And for us, where do we get faith? The Bible says in Romans 10, 17, faith comes from hearing the message. Right? You got to get in the scriptures. But I believe there's more to it. What's he saying? I believe there's such thing as a self-fulfilling prophecy. What does that mean? If you believe something's not going to be good, guess what? If you believe that something won't work, it's not going to work. If you believe your Bible talk won't be fruitful or you won't be fruitful, guess what? Fruitless. Yeah. If you believe you can't change or you can't overcome a sin, guess what? You, you, you are extremely faithful in your faithlessness. You're super right. You can't change. That's why the Bible says in Romans 14, verse 23, anything not done in faith is sin. Yeah. See, we need to make a decision, guys, not to have self-fulfilling prophecies, but God-fulfilling prophecies. How do you do that? Philippians 4, 4 through 8 says, think about what is pure. Yep. Think about what is holy. Think about what is right. Think about, and it, what does that mean? Don't think about what's impure. Don't think about what's negative. Don't think about what's faithless. But look over in Hebrews chapter 3. See, it's scary. The Israelites didn't make it into the promised land, the first generation. Why? Hebrews teaches because of faithlessness. Mm. Revelation 21, 8 teaches the unbelieving don't go to heaven. Therefore, what do we understand? If we lack faith, it's not just a matter of us right now, but it's a salvational issue. Come on. Hebrews chapter 3. Verse 
Verse 1. Therefore, holy brothers who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus. We're well, going to stop right there. How do we overcome? You got to fix your thoughts on Jesus. Amen. Whatever thoughts going in your mind, the Bible says, hey, take captive those thoughts, 2 Corinthians 10, and fix your mind on Jesus Christ. See, it's good to ask, what do you allow yourself to think about? What do you allow your mind to dwell on? If you allow faithless thoughts in your mind, guess what? You're going to be faithless. But if you fix your mind on Jesus, the guy who has more power than you can understand, and let me tell you, you're going to do the impossible. Yeah. And we're going to see the impossible happen. Yeah, At times, I believe the biggest lie that can come into our minds that it's a challenge to take captive is, hey, this place isn't open. Yeah. I can't be fruitful. My ministry can't be fruitful. That you're, I mean, whoa, like, we haven't seen a guy baptism since Joshua Foxworth. Like, maybe it's just, it's just impossible for us to bear fruit. Look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I, I want to show you, not in my opinion, but what the word of God says about this. Come on. I believe in laying things out where they're at. And showing us what the power of God can do. Yeah. First Corinthians chapter three and verse five. What after all is Apollos? What is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe. As the Lord has assigned each to his path, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither the one who plants nor waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his labor. What do we understand? They're ultimately very people-focused in the church in Corinth. So Paul says, hey, it's not about Apollos. It's not about Paul. But what does he teach us? God makes things grow. Yeah. The moment you think, I can't be fruitful, yeah. what are you really saying? Ooh, God. God can't be fruitful. Oh, God. Don't you say, oh, I, this isn't going to happen. This is going to work. You say, oh, God's just powerless. Or you say, hey, why can't I do it with my power? Mm. See, the moment you lack faith about the harvest, you're ultimately just saying, hey, God's word's lying. God's word's not telling the truth. It's impossible to be fruitful here. But what does the scripture say? You are nothing. The one who plants and the wonder waters is nothing. When you start thinking, I can't be fruitful, what are you saying? It's all about me. It's the most egotistic thing in the entire world. Oh, the power of God is supposed to actually be the power of me. Why can't I be fruitful? I'm putting all these pictures of me on Facebook. Doesn't God see how good I look? I should be bearing fruit left and right. But what's, what's the point? God says, hey, somebody plants and somebody waters. What is that? Evangelism, follow-up, and Bible studies. And you got to be diligent in those things. Because if you don't plant and water, guess what? No seed's going to grow. Yeah. But if we do our parts, if we keep working with all of ours and stay faith-filled, get rid of the doubts. Remember Gideon? You can't look at the numbers. Yeah. 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 You can't look at the numbers. But you got to look at the power of God. Keep watering, church. Keep planting. Yeah. Keep following up. Keep up with the campaign. We got one more week with the campaign there. Yeah. Yeah. Let's keep giving all of our hearts. And let me tell you, God's going to make it grow like never before. Yeah. We see this, how our brotherhood started off, our movement of churches. In Los Angeles, in 2007, the L.A. church began. Of course, they came from, Mich- from Portland. They started the mission team from Portland to L.A. And it was a doozy. Why? They took a stand in Portland and said, hey, we want a church with completely sold out disciples. Yeah. We don't want lukewarmness anymore. We don't want people allowed to live in continuous, unrepented sin in a church. Yeah. We don't want a church without discipling. We don't want a church that doesn't call people to the standard of God. Yeah. Come on, brother. Therefore, they took a mission team of 42 people down from Portland, Oregon, to Los Angeles, California. You know what happens when they get there? Portland calls them and says, we want nothing to do with you. They're completely on their own. Yeah. They have, they have, there, there's no turning back. So they can either quit and go find their own way or they can make a decision to let the whole world know. Mm-hmm. So they plant and they water and they plant and they water and they sacrifice and they send people out and they plant. And there's years with barely any growth. There's years with tons of growth. There's years with great things. There's years with challenging. But when times are good, they plant. When times are bad, they plant. And they never give up. Yeah. Yeah. 
And after 11 years, we were 6,000 people on every populated continent of the known world. And let me tell you, I can tell you probably the whole world is beginning to know the true message of the gospel. But today it's time for us to make a decision that we can have the same impact here in Houston. The same impact of that 42 from L.A. You can do it, church. But it's time to have faith like never before, to throw out the doubt, to love the battle, to genuinely love it. Yes, it hurts. Yes, it's hard. Yes, the world teaches what we're doing is crazy and you're crazy. You should give up. Mm. But it's time to fight. So by the end of the day, we will say all of Houston knows. The whole world will know. Thank you. God bless.